as a nation, the British have a love affair with Spain. 12 million people a year come to worship its sun-kissed shores. In this series, I want to know what fascinates us about this country and if there is more to Spain than meets the eye. I'm amazed. I had absolutely no idea that this was here. This will be a journey of discovery for me. I did not expect this. Wow. As I crisscross the country, longing to know more about it, seeing its world-famous landmarks up close. Awesome. Awesome. This is one of the places that everyone should see before they die. And uncovering lesser-known sites. You do literally feel transported. Oh, yeah. As I experience this incredibly vibrant culture. Oh, oh, no. It's pretty mad, isn't it? I think it's just one of those moments I'm never going to forget the whole of my life. <laughs> There's nothing like this anywhere in the world. I've journeyed into the heart of Spain, a vast interior dense with history. In exploring the center of this country, I'll uncover the roots of some of the oldest Spanish traditions. Amidst the peculiar rural landscapes of Consuegra, and in the beguiling plazas of Salamanca. But it all stems from Spain's beating heart, its capital. I've just arrived in Madrid. I've been here a couple of times before, and it's a city that I absolutely love. It feels very grown up and self-assured, and I'm really glad to be back here. Madrid became Spain's capital by default. In 1561, King Felipe II wanted to unify the country by creating a central point. Right in the middle of the Iberian Peninsula, Madrid fit the bill. But despite the royals favoring the city, it took centuries to shake off its past as a poor town full of medieval mud huts and become what it is today the third largest city in the European Union. I'm in Puerto del Sol, which is the geographical center of Madrid. This is kilometer zero, from which every distance is taken in Spain. It's so busy, this square. It's the center of New Year's celebrations, and every madrileño comes here. Madrileño is what residents of the city call themselves, and it doesn't matter if you are born here or not. A common phrase to hear is, if you're in Madrid, you're from Madrid. And if you're from Madrid, the custom is to end your night or start your day in a cafe like this. I'm meeting Fiona for the local speciality. She's a Madrileño who moved here from London 10 years ago. It is so busy. It's been so noisy since I've been in here. There's this constant stream of people. I've been here for 10 years, and I still don't really know when Spanish people see it. This place is really packed around 7 in the morning. So as Madrileños come out from the club and they need something to pick them up before they go to work, the kind of typical thing is to come out from a night out and come here for a nice strong pickup, something sweet. Madrid has evolved into one of the culinary capitals of Europe, but some of its most celebrated dishes are still the most humble ones. Here, the Spanish donut churros, dipped in chocolate, flies out of the kitchen. So this is the best thing to have after a night of drinking. Is it? Yeah. 
so fried like and sugar. Instead of in England, we might go for a kebab. Um, in Spain, you'd go for chocolate and churros. The churros itself is quite salty. And then, the, so the combination of that with the chocolate means that it's not as sickly as you might think. And it's full of oil, but it's very light. No, oh, really. Apparently. Hey. Famous last words. Next, you're going to tell me that it's dietetic. It's, it's very low in calories, I promise. Mmm, <laughs> delicious. So, Fiona, tell me, what makes Madrid so special? It's special because it sort of reveals itself. It's a city of layers. It's like you have to peel it away to discover the neighbourhoods, the barriers, the little corners. And because it's not so touristy, it does still kind of maintain its um, same sense of being Madrid, I guess. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. It's own distinctness. Is there something that characterises Madeleines and what makes them special? I think it's this sense of they sort of live life outside of their homes. So their neighbourhoods are really important. If, even though it's a big city, there's very distinct areas within it. Because it takes them a little while to sort of fall in love with, and then once you live here, you think, I can't really imagine anywhere else in the world that would be better. Madrid, often overlooked by the British, is the must-visit city for the Spanish, who recognize its historical significance in the evolution of their country. Its cultural appeal stems from the royal family, who made Madrid what it is today and resided here until 1931, when the king was exiled to Rome for a period of 45 years. The influence of the monarchy remains. The Palacio Royal is where King Juan Carlos signed the new constitution of Spain in 1978 after Franco's death. It is one of the city's most visited landmarks. This is one of the biggest palaces in Europe, and quite frankly, it makes Buckingham Palace look a bit pathetic. The royal family no longer lives here, but the palace still houses their vast historical collections. Well, this is rather nice, isn't it? What a grand way to enter a palace. It starts to hint at the glories within. The enormous residence took 17 years to build. It has 3,000 rooms, 50 of which are open to visitors. You'd have to spend a whole day just here to really appreciate it. It's pretty impressive, though. But while culture seekers expect opulence at the palace, just a stone's throw away, you can get a glimpse at how the Spanish aristocracy emulated the royals. The Museo Ceralbo is Madrid's best-kept secret. It's the home of a rather eccentric aristocrat of the 19th century. Inside, a wealth of collections from his travels are wonderfully untouched. Wow! What an amazing place. This level of the house would have been the entertaining room. There would have been endless parties, receptions, balls. <sighs> and it was all a big, big show. It's certainly impressing me. This room just suggests to me various things that aren't quite right about my life, such as I don't have one of these. The Marquesa of Ceralbo travelled the world and seemingly hoarded everything from sculptures to clocks, lamps to exquisite porcelains. Just the amount of decorative detail. The Murano glass. Look at this chandelier. <gasps> oh. The combination of everything is 
It's just, I don't know where to look first. Oh, the vase. Beautiful porcelain. The ceiling, the trompe l'oeil. It may seem extravagant. God, there's more. And over the top. I mean, this is a way that any lady should be carried to a party. On the shoulders of four brawny men. <laughs> <laughs> but this is typical of the time. Maybe one day, if I'm very good, I might have a library like this. Oh. The Marquez of Teralbo dedicated his life to preserving this moment in history. Great wealth is so often frittered away. Certainly nowadays, what you read about is people buying the next enormous gig yacht or a collection of fast cars. Things that last but a moment and then are gone, are superseded. What the Marquez de Ceralbo did was, with his incredible eclectic taste, collect all this stuff and save it for the nation. And what a, a worthy enterprise. Away from the mainstream tourist trail, free of crowds, this is a real find. I had no idea that this was here. This is a pretty well-kept secret in Madrid. I'm so glad I'm getting to see it. The overtly lavish lifestyles of the Spanish aristocrat may be a thing of the past, but there is one deep-rooted cultural spectacle that lives on, despite its brutality, as I'm about to discover. It would be wrong of me to come to Madrid and fail to acknowledge Spain's most ancient and controversial attraction, Corrida, the bullfight. It's a time-honored tradition, but the bullfight is shrouded in controversy because ultimately the bull is normally killed. Despite many judging it to be cruelty, it's a part of Spain's heritage and is still as popular as ever in Madrid. The most skilled matadors are like movie stars in Spain, and the top ones can earn millions from performing around the world. to a bullfight before. Although there's been a massive debate about the future of bullfighting throughout Spain, Madrid, in fact, has elevated bullfighting to the status of a protected art form. It is still incredibly popular. And with a much younger demographic than I was expecting. There is a real sense of occasion and excitement among the crowd, but I really don't know what to expect. I don't know. I've always been led to believe it is a true contest between man and beast. I expect to be very moved. Any time blood is spilt, there is emotion. And I'm sure that that is why it's such an addictive thrill. You have to see this to understand Spain. Bullfighting is part of its DNA. Whatever you think about it personally, this is their culture, their tradition. 6.30, it's about to start. Through all the pomp and ceremony, there is a definite tension in the air, as the hours that follow are completely unpredictable. The Iberian fighting bulls have lived rich lives for at least four years, reaching peak condition by the time they're led into the ring. This is 650 kilos of pure rage. What the crowd wants to see is close work, i.e. the man has got to get as close to this enraged bull as possible without being good. It's all the positions that the matador assumes. This 
he was staying so close to the ball. Just bonkers, actually. What? This is a bit where he has to actually kill the ball. I feel quite complicated about it. I mean, I suppose it's a bit stupid of me not to realise that I would, but once they start stabbing him with the peaks and they start, he starts bleeding, then I start enjoying it less. I find it astonishing that in this day and age, young men, and they start quite young, decide to go off and take this up as a lifestyle, as a career choice. I came into this event without any real understanding, but I wanted to see it for myself. I mean, I had to come to a bullfight. I've never done it before and I've always wanted to. I'm glad I went. I have to say, though, it wasn't with unmixed feelings of joy that I experienced this, because although it was fun in the beginning when the bull is fresh, I didn't particularly enjoy the end of it, I must admit. Of course I understand the artistry, the sheer cojones of these guys, you know, in front of this animal with great big horns. But overall, having done it once, I'm not, think I'm not sure I'd be in a hurry to ever do it again but I'm not leaving it there. Just outside the city is Finca Filigre's bullfighting school, where aspiring boys and sometimes girls come and train for many years until they can fight professionally at 16 years of age. I felt very conflicted after seeing that bullfight, but you know, I don't want to be facile. I want to discover what it is that drives people to become a matador. So I need to ask some questions and get some answers. I want to understand why bullfighting is so important to Spanish culture. So I'm meeting Rogelio, who trained to be a matador from the age of nine. Thank you very much for meeting me. Hi. So what is the position of the matador? in today's society? Is it still very highly regarded? Is it a position of, I mean, do people look up to you? Is it, explain to me. Yeah, I think a lot of people watch the bullfighters like a hero. When I was a young boy, I remember when I started fighting that, I, I, my first bullfight I've seen, I watched the bullfighter and I said, that guy is a magician. Why he can fight a bull, make that things, be beautiful, be calm? For me, it was like a magic. It was an, an hero. Today, a lot of people here love the bullfights, and it's very important to be a great bullfighter here in Spain. What is the psychology of a bullfight? I understand and I appreciate this long tradition, mm. but I also know that it's, it's, it's very complex in today's yeah, society, that course. lots of people are against it. So I'd like to understand it so that I can appreciate it better. OK, the first of all, it, this is a tradition, OK? This, this is part of the life. We don't really enjoy the, to kill the bull, really, believe me. We try to make beautiful things with the bull. We try to make art. I know that sometimes it's difficult to know that an animal die, a bull die. But that bull, it's fighting for his life. And if he's a great bull, the president of the bull fight said that you forgive the life of the bull. Then the bull return. But there are a few other performing arts that are this dangerous. In the last 12 months alone, several matadors sustained life-threatening injuries and one died. 
What's the mental process that you go through before a fight, during a fight? Before the fight, you are always thinking about the fight you're gonna have. That you are going to be prepared for a fight that will, sometimes you think that you can die and it's the worst thing you can think in, in that moment, but it happens, it happens to all of us. Then when you arrive to the fight, it's different because in the fight, you are only thinking about make a great fight, try to understand the bull to make a great fight. That's why your you mind is going to be so strong to always think about what you are going to do in the bull ring. There must be an Im immense amount of adrenaline yeah, once of you come out of okay. that ring. The adrenaline is very important for yeah. us because when I have adrenaline, I feel that I'm living, that I'm alive. I have, I'm alive and I try to enjoy every moment because you know that you can die. And do you have children? Do you have a wife? Yeah, I'm married and I have one child. My, my son have a six year old. Yeah. He likes the bullfights, but I really don't want to be a bullfighter because I, I think that if my son fight a bull, poof, oh. for me it's going to be very difficult. I prefer fighting the bull. When you are fighting, you know what you are doing. But the people watching and they think that the bull can hit you, you can die, oof. Very difficult, very I difficult. I really appreciate and it's very important for the bullfighter being the support of the parents. Yeah. It's a highly emotive subject, but here people aspire to this lifestyle which pays well and offers the opportunity to travel the world. Before being unleashed in the bullring, students train intensively, using first fake horns and capes, gradually moving up to cows and finally bulls. And it's beautiful. Okay. It's, yes, it's very complicated to dominate the cape. And we train all day, all day like this, all day like this, and try to have the perfection, the, of the great movement, the correct movement. The future of bullfighting may be uncertain, but I'm glad I had the opportunity to come and see it for myself and make up my own mind about it. I understand much better than I did. And I also have a great deal more appreciation for the art. I completely appreciate that there are many people who think that bullfighting is a barbaric sport. But I think it's very important that you come to a country like Spain and you make at least an attempt to understand their traditions. I, I really think I've done that today. I think um, I'm a wiser person for my meeting with Rogelio. Next, I head south to an area with strong ties to its past, the ancient landscapes of Consuegra. I've left behind the noise of Madrid and arrived somewhere altogether more serene and surreal. A place that inspired a scene in one of the most famous literary works ever to come out of Spain. I've traveled 90 minutes south of Madrid to the town of Consuegra, which is where Cervantes set his famous, famous book, Don Quixote. Centuries ago, there would have been windmills dotting the landscape as far as the eye can see. Now only a few remain. Don Quixote is a middle-aged dreamer, so obsessed with tales of chivalry that he's deluded into believing he's a knight on a quest to restore justice and honor to the world. The windmills are famous because he thought that rather than windmills, they were giants, and so he fought the giants with his spear. Published in 1604, it is acclaimed to be the first modern novel, and critics have discussed it ever since. It still is the obsession of Spain in the same way that Shakespeare is the obsession of England. It's a very romanticized view of an idealistic life, but there is a kernel of truth and value in it for every one of us. Don Quixote's ill-fated adventures are the reason why this peculiar landscape draws visitors. And many Japanese believe he was a samurai, 
fighting these giant windmills. Out of these remaining structures, only one is fully functioning now. Fernando. Fernando was part of a team who restored the 300-year-old Rutheo mill three years ago. It's amazing. Amazing system. Why did you decide to restore it? Because it's a part of our history, it's a part mm -hmm. of our heritage. And we are young people and we need to uh, preserve these kind of things. If not, who can do this? I think there was a long time in the past where everyone was so busy moving forward mm -hmm. that we didn't give value to the things that were behind. Yeah. Now we've come full circle in a way. Show me inside. This mill is fascinating to me. My husband comes from a long line of millers, and so to see this brought back to life is quite astonishing. It's a monster machine. It's very interesting to me. My husband's family were millers of flour all the way back to the Doomsday Book, and the last four generations have been bakers, so one way or another, we've had a lot to do with wood. Bueno, pues eh, la verdad es que es que no quedan, no han quedado carpinteros molineros sí. que nos pudieran transmitir el oficio. Sí. ¿Por qué? Porque se dejaron de construir molinos hace 150 años. Pero había otro oficio muy parecido, que eran los carpinteros que construían carros. Sí. He apprenticed himself to a master cart maker, and he learned how to do the work. Why are you so interested in the mill? Bueno, eh, yo nací en, en, aquí en La Mancha, en Campo sí. de Cristana, sí. eh, un pueblo en el cual hay molinos. Entonces, desde muy pequeño he visto los molinos eh, bueno, pues en un estado un poco ruinoso. Sí. Cuando tengo la oportunidad de trabajar en la rehabilitación de un molino, pues despierta una pasión sí. por este trabajo. Y bueno, pues desde los 16 años ya no he podido dedicarme a otra cosa. This mill was last used commercially 70 years ago. Nowadays, the millings are done purely for tourists and to preserve a long-forgotten job. Entonces, esta harina que nosotros hacemos es 100% natural y completa. Sí. Luego sí que vienen compañeros o amigos que sí que se llevan la harina y fabrican el pan o bizcochos que, bueno, luego nos lo da a probar y muy bueno. Sí. Maybe there is a little of Don Quixote in us all. This is, you know, had no state support. It's a group of friends who decided to do this wonderful thing and to bring the past to life because they understood the value that it has historically. They certainly attempted to live their dream and they've achieved it. But some embody the spirit of Don Quixote more than others. In Spain, the church is a fundamental part of culture. More than 70% of the population identify themselves as Catholic Christians. But 90 minutes north of Consuegra, in the town of Mejorado del Campo, a cathedral is being built that takes that devotion to a level of obsession. This enormous structure is built from recycled materials. Wood, glass, even tomato tins. The scale is quite extraordinary. Inside, you get a true sense of the work still to do. Gosh, it's like an airplane hangar. It's enormous. It's quite an endeavor. I mean, where would you start? The dome alone has taken 30 years to build, and the whole thing looks as though it needs decades more. But what's incredible is that all this is actually the work of one man, and he's a 92-year-old former monk. Described as a modern-day Don Quixote, Don Justo doesn't speak to many people, but he's agreed to talk to me. Hola. Don Hustar, so you're sorry, Alex. Don Hustar, explain to me how this came about. Why did you build this? Bueno, yo he tenido una madre. Sí. 
que era muy piadosa, amaba la iglesia. Sí. Y cuando yo tuve 27 años, me marché al convento. Sí. Entonces, en ese tiempo yo enfermé de tuberculosis. Sí. Y tuvo, tuvo que votar a la comunidad. Y como era contagioso, tuvo que salir. Sí. Okay. Y vino a mi casa, estuve en Madrid un año. Y ya mi madre ya me trajo al pueblo. Y ya como yo tenía una propiedad de mi padre, que es una herencia, pues empecé a replantear hacer la iglesia. He got up hospital and started building this in 1961. So he's been building it 55 years. Y como amo tanto la iglesia, pues está claro. Hice una iglesia lo que pude. Todo lo que tengo se lo he dado. Un ideal, todo, todo cristiano. Me. Are you formally trained as an engineer or as an architect? No, 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 no quiero estudio. Yo soy, yo sé las cuatro reglas, no sé más, no quiero más. No me interesa, el mundo no me interesa. Me interesa el, a Cristo. El, el flujo de Cristo me sobra. Where do you get your inspiration from? De Cristo, por favor. Yo soy labrador, no entiendo de arte. Le tengo que pedir, llamarle y buscarle. Cristo. ¿Tú crees en Cristo? ¿Sabes quién es Cristo? Sí. Ah, pues ese. Don Justo relies on donations of materials, which is perhaps why his masterpiece is taking so long. Have you ever felt like just giving up and walking away? Yo? Que va. Cada vez más le amo. No. <laughs> se va consiguiendo mucho más. No, 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 no se puede eso. No se puede eso. El que pone las manos en el arado y viste la vista para atrás no vale. Onward, ever onward. <laughs> you know, I really do admire Don Justo's 55 years of devotion, but I can't help but be concerned about the mountain that he still has to climb. I think work in progress doesn't begin to describe it. You know that moment when you're doing a project and everything's a mess, but you know all of a sudden it all comes together? I think we're some way off that. <laughs> I'm really struggling with this. I mean, there's definitely lovely ideas. Like, I can see those stained glass windows may one day look nice. But I just kind of can't get why he just wouldn't finish one stained glass window before moving on to the next one. It's, it's really frustrating. I mean, gosh, do I feel Virgoan at this point. I, mean, I feel it's making me quite anxious, just the sheer scale of the disorder. help but feel compelled to leave a contribution in support of this man's endeavors. But Don Justo's cathedral is still to be recognized by the Catholic Church. Don Justo, God bless him. The Spanish seem to be either incredibly traditional and conventional or complete iconoclasts. And clearly he's of the latter variety. Of course, <laughs> I love people dreaming big. But I like people who dream big and accomplish something. I'm a realist, maybe not quite enough a dreamer. Next, I reach the final stop on my exploration, the historical university city, Salamanca. journey through the heart of Spain has taken me to my final point, two hours west of Madrid, the enchanting city of Salamanca. I've never been to Salamanca before. This is Spain's most famous university city, and I can see why. Founded in the 11th century, Salamanca is home to the country's oldest university. After Bologna in Italy and Oxford, it's among the oldest in the world. Its enduring reputation as a place to come and study makes it a lively city to be in, with its burgeoning student population. 
However, its elegant architecture means it's a serene city to wander. Plaza Mayor is a highlight for many visitors, day or night. This is, well, frankly, one of the most beautiful squares I've ever seen, partly because there's not one thing to ruin the harmony of it. I love it. I love it. I want to stay here for a few days and actually get to enjoy it. It's completely magical. But whilst the architecture makes tourists to Salamanca marvel, it's not unusual to find some seemingly mesmerized as they study the intricately sculpted facades of one of the city's cathedrals. Because here, all is not quite as it seems. So I am looking at the cathedral, and what I'm looking for specifically is the astronaut and the gargoyle eating an ice cream. This has become a bit of a tradition in Salamanca. Tourists come and try and spot these anomalies. Anomalies are to the work of a so-called prankster, who was recently tasked with the restoring part of the building and thought it would be funny to make a few modern additions. He only managed to get away with it a few times, but his work remains. You have to be rather eagle-eyed to see it, though. I see anything. Oh, there's the, I can see the astronaut. It's very obviously an astronaut. I mean, there's no mistaking him for something med medieval. <laughs> and, oh, yes, and look, this rather charming gargoyle with his tail somehow. I hope it's his tail wrapped around <laughs> several times. <laughs> it's eating an ice cream. <laughs> They're brilliantly done. I mean, what a, what a good wheeze. I love it. I'm on a roll now. That is another example of the prankster restorer's work. I would have thought that it was original. This particular one plays homage to a student tradition here known as a tuna, roving musicians who've sung on the streets for centuries. <laughs> out of the need for money to pay for their studies, nowadays it's still a badge of honor to be a student in Atuna. I've heard that they like to serenade the ladies, and I wonder if that's the appeal. To try and find out, I'm meeting Javier and Rodrigo, who play as part of Salamanca's medical faculty, Tuna. Hi. 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 Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Thank you so much. What does it mean for you to be in a tuna? It's so many things. I mean, for me, the most important thing is uh, the brotherhood, because we, we travel together, and we play music together, we party together. So first of all, it has to be the music, but later you, you start to discover another things that you love it. It's a forma different way of living life. In the época of student, it's very different, because it opens a lot of the world. It opens a lot of doors of things that you can't do as a student, really. Like you can travel around the world gratuitamente. Yes. Yes, we do travel around the world, not only in Spain. So you do it for love of music? Do people give you money still? If they want to. 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 If they want Sometimes. <laughs> que la tuna es lo más importante, porque la tuna básicamente es para rondar mujeres en los balcones. Ah, oh, I see. Now the truth comes out. Aha! Uh -huh. Actually, most people come and join one of these things so that they can pull. It seems many find the 17th century costume rather appealing. You have to have a nicely turned leg to wear something like that. I like it. Yeah, very nice. Do you think so? <laughs> yes, I do think so. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> the unofficial motto of the Tuna in Salamanca is, one must look for life. Perhaps they should add, and love. Can't wait to see it. Seeing a tuna play in Salamanca is all a part of the experience, and you're most likely to catch them serenading tourists in Plaza Mayor, which takes on a fittingly romantic glow at night. Apparently, it's easy to become spellbound by their ensemble of traditional Spanish, Portuguese, and Latin American love songs. <laughs> I'm
It's not long before I'm the target of this Tuna's affections. Here he comes again. He's a trier, I'll give him that. Bravi, bravi, bravi. So good. What's not to like? Pesa un poco. Es pesada. La capa. Pesa. Sí, pesa. Es para que las mujeres no se escapen. Le pone la capa para que no se vayan. He said, he said, is it heavy the cake? And he said it's so that the woman can't get away. I think I pulled. <laughs> my husband needn't worry, though. Gosh, what an amazing end to this part of my Spain trip. To end in this stunning university city with these really fun guys. I was warned that the Spanish really know how to have fun, and so I found it. Of all the places I've been to so far, this part of Spain has intrigued me the most. When you journey to its heart, you're exposed to so many layers of history still wonderfully preserved. The thing that always fascinates me is people who battle so hard to keep traditions alive. And also that the people who are passionate about what they do transmit their passion so fervently. I think what I take away from, from this is to just live every moment and to appreciate what you have and not be scared to think big. Next time, my journey concludes in northwestern Spain, where I'll discover ancient traditions. It's like dancing. Sample the delicacies. I've probably put worse things in my mouth. And finish in Spain's holiest city. This is the final point. You know you've arrived, you know you've done it.